So I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit about how you uh, became interested in music and what led you to, I guess, pursue it as a career. Uh, I started piano lessons when I was four. My, my uh, grandmother was a violinist and she had a piano and kept a piano at my mother's house. And um, the legend has it, because I really don't remember, that I started picking out tunes when I was two or three that I'd heard. And then I started piano lessons at four. Um, I ended up studying privately for a, quite a while, um, became a piano performance major at USC, um, dropped out of there because I was, I had reached a point where I really didn't think I wanted to pursue a career as a classical pianist and kind of bummed around for a while, ended up in a couple of very um, amateurish type rock and roll bands. However, one of them was, was making an album. Um, so I made a couple albums with this band called Mama Lion, which was a terrible band. But uh, it exposed me to a number of people that were rec- uh, working in the record industry at that point. So um, a couple of them were generous enough to hire me to play keyboards, either synthesizers or, or piano. So I did that for a while. And then I made a, a very kind of uh, odd instrumental album. And uh, oddly enough, it ended up... Uh, ended up on Elton John's desk, strangely enough, sometime in 1973. And, um, in 74, he, I got a call from somebody. It's a long story. I won't go into now. But I ended up joining Elton John's band in 75. Um, and the great thing about being in Elton's band was I had an opportunity to learn how rhythm sections and rock and roll and keyboards interfaced with orchestras because there was quite a significant orchestral component to Elton's music. And, right. um, he was very generous about letting me learn how to do that. And um, I quit the band after a couple of years because I didn't want to be on the road that much. Um, and uh, made a couple of, produced quite a bit, co- did a lot of arranging, orchestration, and then somebody offered me a movie in 1985, which I turned down initially because I was too nervous and insecure about doing it. I really didn't know how to do it. But, um, I ended up doing it and uh, absolutely fell in love with the whole process, and that's really been my primary occupation for you know almost thirty years now. It was a complete accident. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, in those early years, do you consider uh, any composers to you know be big influences on you? Yeah, I mean, I think certainly as film composers, probably Jerry Goldsmith. Um, I was a big Jerry Jerry Goldsmith fan. I loved the way he wrote action music in particular. He used a lot of odd time signatures and his tempos were always sort of remarkably slow, which I thought was incredible. You didn't have to write super fast, frenetic music to accompany an action sequence. Right. I always found them very muscular and very memorable in that regard. And then, then of course, I had all of my classical composer influences. You know, certainly, you know, my the biggest ones probably be Beethoven and Ravel and Debussy and Stravinsky and uh, quite, a, quite a number of, of rock and roll people as well. So I was fortunate to be exposed to lots of different kinds of music over a long period of time, which I thought was, I think it was really helpful. I mean, so, so when you started out, did you start like immediately trying to find your own voice or were you, were you I guess, mimicking, you know, their compositions and learning from them? Yeah, I suppose it's unavoidable that that one is going to, you know, mimic, because that's a good word, um, people who really know what they're doing, because frankly, I didn't really know what I was doing in terms of a, from a compositional sense, because I had never studied composition, but oddly enough, when I first started watching film as a, as a, in the role of a composer, it was the first time in my life I started hearing music in my head. And it really didn't happen much before then, so I was very much a late bloomer. But um, I think that I—I I don't think I ever consciously tried to express my own voice. I just, you know, most of the time you're in some kind of survival mode, just trying to finish a score in a very finite amount of time. And, and hopefully, the more you do it, um, you know, your own voice starts to emerge. But uh, yeah, I certainly did sound like a lot of people for a long time, and I, I mean. I might, I might still, I don't know. <laughs> it's hard to say. So, as a composer, what do you try to bring to a film? And I guess, um, do you have a sense of what makes you a good composer? 
you know, I think I'm, I think I, I'm intuitively good at understanding the way the music is supposed to feel in a, in a scene. Um, or at least one way that the music can feel in the scene. One thing I've learned certainly is that, you know, there's so many different ways of interpreting a movie and you can, you can change the uh, fundamental meaning of a scene or the direction of the scene or the point of view of the scene in a million different ways, depending on what kind of music you put in there. But um, I think I've become a better listener. I think I've learned to not, uh, I think I've been more economical with my writing. I think I overwrote too much uh, for the first first 10 years that I did this. I think I still do sometimes. I still find that, you know, one has to remember that uh, I'm, I'm there in the service of a film. And but it's, you know, you're, you're trying to accomplish multiple tasks simultaneously, certainly express yeah. your own point of view, support the director's point of view, um, support the film dramatically. Um, so there are a lot of different things to try and take into consideration, but ultimately, uh, ultimately I guess I, I am successful at, at musically interpreting what, what uh, the director is trying to express, I guess. It's a hard thing to teach, you know. I... I find that the, the core um, ability to be able to do this job is kind of not teachable. I think one gets better at it. I think one's own ability has become more sharply focused over time, but it's very difficult to be taught how to respond um, sensitively and innovative in an innovative way um, uh, to a movie. And I suppose that at this point, that's probably what I'm trying to do most is, is find a different way to do everything I've done a hundred times before. Right. That's a, that's a kind of a painful search sometimes. So, as, as you mentioned, like, you can have one scene and you can take it a number of different ways. And I'm just wondering, I assume between you and the director, what that dialogue is like. Um, who gets the final say in that, in that situation? <laughs> um, certainly the director gets the final say. Um, and it's very tough, you know. I'm I'm working on a movie now with um, a director named Ed Swick, and I've done a, a number of films with him, including Blood Diamond and Defiance. Right. He's a he's a very strong director uh, in many ways, not the least of which is music, and he has very strong opinions. And routinely, you know, I'll spend days on the scene and play it for him, and uh, you know, for one reason or, or another, it's it's uh, rejected. That's the wrong word, but there, there are so many notes associated with the playback that it feels like a, it feels like a rejection. But that's kind of the standard, uh, that standard behavior and standard procedure is, mm -hmm. is, is uh, constant rewriting, and that discussion with the director can be, you know, it can be difficult. It can be frustrating. Um, but ultimately, I think it's essential to believe and understand that it's a collaborative enterprise. If you're going to so you've done so many films that kind of run the gambit of budgets and themes and locations and I was wondering um, how you choose the films you work on it really has a lot to do with previous relationships um, musical opportunities once in a while there'll be a script that comes along that I imagined is you know just a remarkable opera whatever the 21st century of a Lawrence of Arabia, Lawrence of Arabia would be. And that's, I think everybody's, every film composer's dream is to do a movie like that. And, and actually, I've been very lucky in terms of having films with large orchestral canvases available to me. Um, most recently, I did a movie with Angelina Jolie called Maleficent, which is coming out soon, that I worked you know, for almost a year and a half on. It has over 100 minutes of music in it, and it's really... A, just a big sweeping romantic adventure orchestral score. That's the most fun. I mean, I the more the more of that I can do is that that's really what I seek out. Um, I try and find directors, try and continue to work with directors who uh, who are. It's a productive relationship and, and not a uh, not an endlessly um, uh, revising just for the sake of revising or, or changing directions in the middle of a movie or those kinds of things so yeah I mean I guess it has to do with previous relationship quality of the script and musical opportunity um, 
do you have an ideal amount of time for scoring a film? Because I know, I think, like, after King Kong, you kind of have a reputation of being a, a fast composer. And I imagine that can sometimes be difficult. Yeah, I mean, King Kong was a uh, was a total anomaly and one that I would hope never to repeat again. Not because the relationship with Peter Jackson wasn't great. It was great, but it was just such a ridiculous amount of work in a short time. I think it was... I think it becomes physically very draining, and quite frankly, at 62, I just don't don't want to do that anymore. Um, not that 62 is particularly old, but it's old to be sitting in a chair for 18 hours a day for six weeks trying to compose. So, um, and I, I think I am a fast composer. I probably it's 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 a it's an advantage, and it's it's also um, a liability as far as I'm concerned because I think sometimes I. I, I settle too quickly with an idea, and I just kind of move on with my patience level. Sometimes I have to extract from myself a little more tenacity, a little more patience with the scene, rather than quickly accepting an idea that I have, because at this stage, I, I have so many solutions to any filmic situation. Um, I've done every imaginable kind of car chase, airplane chase, and love scene, and interrupted by murders, and crap falls, and I mean, whatever you, you can imagine, so it's... I think it's important to reject one's own ideas in the, in the early stages. Although sometimes I have to say those earliest ideas do come back and, and turn out to be very good ones. But um, I, I, I try and, and challenge myself to come up with new ways of doing things all the time. Right. And I mean, you do a lot of very different films. I mean, one, one month you could be doing something like Lady in the Water and the next something like Blood Diamond. Um, and I was wondering how you go from those, you know, very different projects back to back. Um, you know, I don't know how really. I, I, I just, <laughs> uh, so far I've just been lucky, you know. I, ideas keep coming. I seem to have a lot of okay ideas, uh, some better than others. I, um, I try, for the most part, I avoid certain kinds of movies. I'm not a big romantic comedy guy anymore. Um, even though the, the, the few romantic comedies I've done that were of significance, I, I really enjoyed them. I thought they were they were kind of on the smarter end of romantic comedies. But comedy music for me is presents the least um, opportunity for something you know, substantive writing, unless unless you're somebody like uh, John Bryan or. Who else did something? Oh, um, I really liked the score for her a lot, which is not so much a comedy, but I, th I think younger, um, more contemporary-oriented composers have a better take on, on, on comedy, and they do a smart version with a small ensemble that I admire, and it's not something that I feel I do particularly well. So maybe I stay away from comedies. Um, uh, but other than that, I mean, and I do try and, and, and keep sort of keep the mix interesting. Um, I think I've always been lucky in that regard, having lots of different kinds of movies to work on. Right. So, I mean, you mentioned uh, Ed Zwick earlier, and I was wondering if I could just, you know, ask you for a minute about Blood Diamond, because it's one of my favorite scores of yours, and it has this kind of distinct indigenous feel to it that I don't think, you know, is as frequent um, in your scores. And I was just wondering, is that a fine line to walk between, like, establishing a sense of place for a film and then connecting to something that's, I guess, deeper or more universal. Yeah, that's a really good question. I think it is a fine line. You know, you, you're not, you don't want to write a travel log, you know, and it's, and it's, um, the, those kinds of movies are, are um, just filled with all kinds of potential um, uh, traps, and it's very easy to fall into putting an ethnic flute, and if you're, you're in Indonesia and you put in some kind of a funny flute, or you're design some percussion palette that seems appropriate to Africa or something. And I I guess what I, what I found with Blood Diamond was what I tried to stay focused on in a movie like that, and which is kind of a universal truth, I think, is two things. Character point of view, whose point of view are we in, and really the emotional core of the movie, and to really express that and to find that. And I think if that, I mean, I think you could take that score, even though it certainly has some African sort of elements in it, but I think you could play it for any number of romantic movies in many places. Um, and it would probably succeed because it, it had a very strong melodic content. And um, again, I think it was it was it was connected really more to the heart than to a place. Uh, 
So I think once once the once the emotional uh, content is is pretty solid, then I think it's easy to adorn it with with some more exotic sounds. But uh, I, I will say that's the only score I ever wrote where the the main theme is played by the bass. So I, I was kind of happy about that. In a funny mm-hmm. way. And I do love that theme. And there's there's a number of themes in there that you know have the all the African trappings surrounding them, but they don't you know, melodically particularly speak to any, you know, specific location. It's a lot more, I guess, universal than that, which I love about it. You know, it also really helps when somebody makes a, a good movie <laughs> because um, I thought the movie was really good and the performances were great. Mm. Uh, you know, I often use uh, a movie like Michael Clayton as an example, which to me was a, a good score. It was nothing wrong with the score, but people completely overreacted to how great they thought that score was. And I feel like I've done that sort of score many, many times, uh, electronic that kind of scores. People didn't even, they would say to me, oh my God, I had no idea you did that kind of thing. And that's largely because it, it's easy for one's best work to end up in a movie that's not so good. And then it tends to kind of go down with the ship like everybody else. But a movie like Blood Diamond or Michael Clayton, it highlights, it makes everybody look good. I think it's just one's, everybody's work just tends to shine a little yeah, and there's also, especially in Blood Diamond, there's a, you know, quite a big canvas for you to work with. There's a lot of spaces where there isn't that much, you know, dialogue or noise there. And I assume that's, you know, what you're talking about with Lawrence of Arabia too. There's just, you know, endless space for a composer to work with, which I imagine is just right. invigorating. Yeah, it is, and it's rare, you know. And um, uh, it's great to have a movie that, that, you know, you can you can do subtle touches to small gestures and have them be meaningful instead of trying right. to make so much noise all the time. So um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about scoring a series of films. Obviously, you're doing Hunger Games right now. Um, and, you know, some actors have said that they don't like taking on franchises or, I guess, TV because they either lose interest or find it difficult to portray the same character over and over again over multiple entries. And I'm wondering, as a composer, what kinds of considerations go into scoring a series of films like that for you? Well, you know, I, I think I was lucky in the in the case of the Hunger Games. The, the first movie was directed by Gary Ross, and he did a, a great job. It, but it, 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 it a very clear sense of place, which is you know District Twelve. Which I, you know, people I tend to, I guess, tend to associate that with some kind of Appalachian place. So, and it, and music, the music in that movie tended to be quite not not nearly as big and, and epic sounding as it did in Number Two. So. Right. I felt that I could I could score that movie with a smaller ensemble. And when Francis Lawrence, who I'd worked with several times before, came on board for the second one, my intention before I even saw the film was to reinvent the music in every possible way, except in a couple of themes. Um, and that really worked. And my, I guess the thing I'm counting on is that with the exception of two or three themes, I think every one of these movies, now I've never read the book, so I don't know what to expect from number three. But I, uh, as I understand it, it tends to take it's going to take place a lot more in urban environments and, and be in a more sort of political action kind of thriller. A lot more of those kinds of elements in it. Um, so I don't know. I really don't think about it too much. I think once the once the, the themes are established, I, uh, then I then I think one has complete freedom and latitude to just move in any direction you want. I don't think right. I don't think I established a, a real specific sound for the Hunger Games so much. Um, here and there, there's an instrument that comes back and plays something that maybe you know, resonates a little bit from the first movie. But um, I just sort of sort of t- maybe this is a weakness of mine. I'll just sort of take it as it as it comes and, and just see see how it goes. But um, you know, scoring Jennifer Lawrence is, is a joy. I mean, she's <laughs> such a great natural actor. It just makes my job a lot easier. It's very telling for um, a composer to work with performances that aren't so good because they wear very thin very quickly when you're watching a scene hundreds of times. So um, I find her and everybody else in the whole process of that particular bunch of movies to have, to have so far been really inspiring. So. One of the, the very first scores that I can distinctly remember leaving an impression on me was Dinosaur. And I was, I don't know, six years old at the time. And it was a score that, I guess, for the first time, I really wanted to seek out outside of the context of the film. 
And I think generally your scores really lend themselves to this standalone listen. I was wondering if you're mindful of that when you're composing, you know, their future album releases and such. Um, gosh, that's, that's probably for me the best compliment you could give me. And <laughs> I thank you for that. And I, I do think about that a lot, actually. Um, uh, I, I'm kind of a snob in terms of when I, when I hear, um, other work out there that I feel that has been kind of phoned in and, and people have achieved a certain level of success and then they, they stop trying as hard. So I do think about that. I, I do hope uh, when I'm working on it that the, that the music will have enough interest to have a life beyond the movie. Um, yeah, I spend a lot of time thinking about that, maybe too much, you know, because I think sometimes maybe I overcomplicate the, the issue and I write something that maybe I have more counterpoint in there than I necessarily needed just because I think it's more interesting to listen to, but maybe it doesn't serve the film as well as some a simpler approach, but it's something I think of very specifically. Do you have any uh, scores of yours that you're particularly fond of, just maybe how they came together on their own or how they worked with the film? Um, you know, I really liked King Kong, quite frankly. I liked King Kong. I like um, a movie called Snow Falling on Cedars that I did right. about 15 years ago. I think that was a beautiful movie and a, and a, and a good score. Um, I'm very fond of this new movie that I just finished, Maleficent. Um, that, in some ways, I think is my best orchestral uh, score. Um, wow. At least one that I'm favorite with my favorite right now, but, you know, it depends. I think you have to kind of love the thing you're doing right at the moment more than anything else you've ever done, otherwise you couldn't get through it. So can you talk a little bit about your approach to scoring that film? Because that's something I'm really curious about, and obviously we haven't heard of it yet, so uh, a lot of anticipation surrounding it. Um, there, was, there was much discussion about the tone of the movie for a long time. You know, it's, it's, um, it's a fantasy, and it's a, it's a classic story, and certainly to some extent uh, targeted towards younger people I mean, how do I say this I think it, it has it's quite a dark movie and yet it's quite a um, it's it's a fairy tale so I think um, there was a lot of adjusting of the intensity of the music um, at first there was maybe more of an emphasis for the, for the music to be more darker and a little more aggressive and more muscular and as time went on my perspective, certainly all the way along, was that it was a beautiful fairy tale movie, and, and, and it should be expressed in that regard um, much more so than in a sort of dark ambient way. Mm -hmm. um, although, having said that, there's there's plenty of electronics and ambient sort of music in it. But I think ultimately, it sounds like a very traditional, big, beautiful Disney fairy tale movie. Wonderful! I'm excited Which for that I, one. <laughs> you know, I'm excited to do because I have so much regard for those movies. I, there's a great tradition in Disney movies back to you know, Fantasia of just uh, beautiful orchestral music and, and uh, great images. So, I mean, it, I, I've worked with a particularly large orchestra. I worked with several choirs. There's, there's a significant, more significant than normal choral element in it. There's a lovely boys' choir aspect to it, which I really liked. Um, just kind of everything. Wonderful. Um, so, Kind of to conclude, this is a question that I love asking composers whenever I get the chance. I was wondering if there are any film scores that you recommend everyone listen to, like any of your personal favorites. Um, I think um, Shawshank Redemption is mind-bogglingly great. Um, just about anything from John Williams is, is great to listen to for me. Um, particularly his dark, I'm a huge fan of John's dark music. Um, I love like the Velociraptor scene in the Jurassic Park. And that was yeah. just fantastic. I think Close Encounters is an amazing score. Um, Bernard Herrmann, any, lots of Bernard Herrmann, uh, I think is, is extraordinary. Um, I would take, I would take one Bernard Herrmann, one Tom <laughs> Newman, Shawshank Ridge, Redemption, particularly because to me that was a that was a complete uh, watershed moment in film scoring that I had never heard anything like that, and I think it was just so so beautifully conceived. Um, a couple of John Williams, 
Randy Newman's score to The Natural, extraordinary. Um, I love, what's his name, Steve Price's score to uh, Gravity. Yeah, that was, I thought that was amazing. What he it did was amazing. That. It was just fantastic. You know, the funny thing was, he was my music editor on Batman Begins. And um, I had no idea he was a composer, but... <laughs> Yeah, he just did a great job, so I love that score. You know, there's so many I love. I, I couldn't say there's just one score, especially now that electronics and, you know, so many different forces are, are you know, embraced now in film music that there's just too many, too many good things out there. Right, and then you have, like, bands like Arcade Fire moving into film scoring. and Loved that. That was just 